Okay, welcome to my next uh, free lecture Friday, which is actually getting posted on a Thursday, but I believe it's probably Friday in Asia, so that's close enough. So anyway, this week um, I wanted to talk about uh, creating your own sources of inspiration, and in addition to this, it's also going to include um, some of my techniques uh, when I do my design work. But, you know, if I put that all in the title, it'd be way too long. So there you go. It's just uh, creating your own sources of inspiration. So what I want to do is I'm going to take you on a tour of uh, basically what I have on my hard drive that um, I use all the time when I need to um, supplement my design process or get inspired myself. Um, and so there'll be techniques and some other examples. So I call them source books. And I will hit the source books in a minute. They're basically just folders on my hard drive, but that's the big overriding topic. Um, so I use 3D a lot. And so, I, like I said, it's going to be some techniques and it's going to be some um, photography and all different sorts of things. So uh, 3D based underpainting is one thing I do quite a bit. So if I have some design direction that I like and I've done a pencil sketch of it, then maybe I'll jump into something like Moto and um, rough out a shape, and then I'll paint over the top. And so that's just a simple example of those are some of the layers I had in my Photoshop file. And uh, you see what came out of Moto was basically the, some of the front suspension, some of the back, and the wheels and tires. And the rest is just painted over on top. And then I'll start out and I'll block out a shape, um, rough out the proportions. Uh, so especially for vehicles, but really for anything, 3D has become so fast now um, that once you have an idea, that um, it's easy to go in and block it out. And then I paint over the top, maybe rough out the design direction, and then jump back into 3D, uh, model up some of those other panels in 3D. And then when we want to make this for a nice book illustration, uh, we'll weather this up just by taking this and doing another rendering. So there's a base render. Here's the next render, and it's just uh, matte, you know, tan or, you know, light brown dust color. And then we throw it on top in uh, Photoshop and erase out the things that we don't want. So that's how you can get some really quick weathering across the whole surface. So if, if that clean vehicle was driving around in a dirty environment, it would pick up all this dust, and then you just go in and erase it off of the areas where it would be worn off a bit, like, you know, maybe they clean off the windows, that sort of thing. Here's another base model. So see, my models stay quite simple a lot of times. And then I throw, and these these were from uh, Drive. So there's the dust layer, and then here's the final of the two put together, and some painting in Photoshop back over the top to put in cut lines and all that sort of thing. Uh, Neville gave me this. Neville Page gave me this uh, figure that to play with as an example. And then a lot of times I'll just take photography and warp it across the top, and then paint back over it. So you get a lot of interesting graphics that way. And it makes for doing really fast studies, especially when you're looking for designs. Let's say we just want to design the suit of this character. You know, I don't want to have to draw this from scratch every time. And I need it to be accurate to what Neville's designing, let's say, um, on the figurative side for his creature. And then I've got to go in and figure out the suit. And, you know, many times you'll do multiples of those. So this makes it a really simple and fast way to go. And it's not just limited to figurative work. You can also do it for environments. So this is an environment that I roughed out in Modo, and I'm using a um, like a, a mask to mask out the sunlight above. So there's dappled light, like it looks like it's coming through some broken clouds off in the distance there. And um, I painted the HDR in the background, and then staged it and ran this base render. And then once it was done, took it into Photoshop, added the blowing dusk, added the you know smoke coming out of that stack, gave it a little more life because obviously something's you know alive over there if that factory's working. And then uh, this sort of sludge pond um, you know effect in the foreground. This is another one. And the entire environment was done with just um, basically drivers um, driving this displacement map. It wasn't even a map. There's no there's no 2D part of this model for the environment. It's just literally um, a graph to drive displacement. And that I had a really simple base mesh with an arch and a couple of cylinders in the background. And then the surface became manipulated by playing with those drivers. And then I dropped in one of my little uh, Photoshop paintings from Blast. I just took it out, cut it out, stuck it in there, and then have this guy flying through that arch. So it's a really fast way to visualize things. This is a sky that I made in using the program View. 
It's a VUE, and it's got great atmospheric skies. And so a lot of times I'll just jump in and kind of like I'm creating my own photography. And uh, I can make it the resolution I need, etc. And you'll so you can find this background in one of my paintings from from uh, Blast as well. So now flipping to the old school way of doing things. So like I said, this talks to me kind of about technique and how I do things, and also um, about inspiration. So they're gonna, there's a lot of happy accidents and abstraction within this, but there's also some very practical uh, examples like this is uh, old school sketch models. So this is a rendering I had done in side view, a Photoshop rendering of one of my concept bikes. And I wanted to do something, you know, a bit more in perspective, not just a draft view. So I printed it on a piece of uh, laser, you know, just a 11 by 17 piece of paper, stuck it to some foam core, cut out the foam core, and then lit it because really what I was after was that complex cast shadow. And I didn't want to have to take the time to plot that. And, and it was actually faster for me to, you know, do this process than it was to plot that shadow. And also it allowed me the ability to experiment with different compositions um, and different lighting scenarios. Because basically, effectively, a bicycle is, for the most part, a 2D object because um, it's very thin. And so all I had to do was put some pedals sticking out, put some handlebars on it. Uh, there's a little piece of paper wrapped, just glued to the top of that seat. You can see it actually casting a shadow on the side there. That's actually giving me enough fuller shadow down on the bottom. So a couple little simple things. Also, there's a uh, diamond a diamond shaped fork in top view. And you see I get the nice shadow for that. And that allows the front wheel to turn and that hub steering. And then here's the rendering done in Photoshop. But you'll see that the shadow came from and then when I my original you know foam core study model and when I changed the design right in my Photoshop rendering I just changed the shadow accordingly so if I filled in an area that I knew I had to go back in and fill in the shadow but you can see I got a really nice complex uh, shadow that gave me a lot of realism since all the rest of it is straight up Photoshop that's kind of a nice balance of the two so here's another paper model this is for you know some old old project um, doing a uh, laptop, old laptop, when they used to be a lot thicker. And then there's the Photoshop rendering. And here's a clay model. So a lot of the helmets I've done, bicycle helmets, uh, I've sculpted, I don't know how many. Um, I usually sculpt them in a half model and stick them on a first surface mirror. So there's no thickness to the um, offset to the reflection. Right, With a regular mirror, you get a double reflection and a wide gap, which is as wide as the thickness of your glass. In this case, it's like a half-inch thick mirror, but you look at the gap, it's nice and tight on a center line, and that's because it's a first surface that's reflective. Um, you're not looking through the glass to the shiny silver. So uh, this is a, you know automotive clay, and I usually just rough these out, stick them on that mirror, then photograph them. I don't worry about the background because I'm going to pull it out in Photoshop, clean it up, colorize it, um, figure out where's the hard shell versus the um, foam, etc. And so here's one that's been painted up. This was a master pattern I made. Um, actually, no, this was just a study model. Later, I made the master pattern. And uh, again, automotive clay, all hand sculpted. Stick it on a mirror. And this mirror actually is thin, and that actually isn't a first surface mirror. And if you look closely, you'll see um, around, around that far right side of the the reflection, you'll start to see a fuzzy double reflection of that helmet. Um, and the gap along center line is much thicker. Uh, here's a couple more clay helmets, this time a BMX. Two different styles, left and right. And then here are some of the cleaned up helmet concepts, not the ones I showed before, but other clay models. Just for some concept stuff uh, a long time ago, back actually 00, zero 13 years ago this project was and it was more full coverage helmet and um, you'll see that they you can still see some clay sculpting lines but I've gone in and cleaned up the Photoshop line down the center and makes for a nice quick presentation so a lot of times I do mirroring um, in 3d so I'm still kind of in this 3d category um, whether it's you know traditional sculpting or 3d digital modeling so this is a sort of kit bashed car also for drive and then here I turned it into a spaceship and so first I just mirrored everything on the car right to get the far side and make something interesting and then I took the entire car and I mirrored it to the other side to see if I could create an interesting little spaceship and so that's what came from taking the car flipping it 90 degrees getting rid of the wheels uh, deleting a few of the other elements and then just pulling on the polygons um, to find some interesting proportion and I never did anything with this, it was just a little test. 
Um, it didn't go into a book or anything. So I just grabbed an astronaut off the internet there and threw him in to uh, have scale reference. Here's another one. This actually, I think it was something I grabbed out of uh, SketchUp, probably out of the 3D warehouse. It's actually a piece of architecture. It's like a greenhouse or something. And then I just grab the, the vertices and just push and pull, come up with an interesting side and then mirror it to the other side. And then when you're mirroring it, of course, automatically you get, you know, things like uh, portraits, vehicles, you know, lots and lots of things um, that we interact with, that we design are perfectly symmetrical. So it's a great way to get things that are recognizable and look real. And then we take that model and we um, do a little weathering pass in Photoshop. So I get maybe the base render is just matte black and then we scratch it up. I think actually Anise probably, Anise Naeem probably did this one, <clears throat> which became a bigger rendering later um, inside uh, Drive. And there's another side view. That's also one that's just been worked over a bit in Photoshop. Okay, something I really like to play with, which is really fun because it's like cheating uh, in a big way. And so if you're coming from the 2D world and you're not a great 3D modeler and you're impatient and you don't want to spend forever modeling something and modeling architecture, you can actually uh, create fake looking architecture in a very complex looking way with, without doing a lot of modeling. And so you can take your 2D skills that you're very good at and you have, let's say, a lot of custom brushes in your library. And so I took one of my custom brushes maybe two, and I just turned up the spacing. I just made a really long texture map, black and white, hard edges, and um, that was it. Took, you know, 10 minutes. Then I went into Modo, and for this environment, I made a cylinder, and I bent the cylinder around, had a little flat spot in the bottom for the track, and all I did was uh, duplicate it and make it a little bit larger, and all of this uh, tunnel, it's not really a tunnel, but this bridge that you're seeing, which is the track and all the architecture above it, is using a stencil map. And then I think Danny Gardner did the final detailing on this rendering, and he added a couple vertical struts here and there, hold, looks which you, know, you see off to the right there in the background, which looks like it's holding that thing up. Um, but for the most part, 98% of this tunnel came out of Modo, and it was driven by this stencil map. So that's a really fun way to work. Um, and you can get, especially if you're doing concept work for entertainment, you, without having to build the actual physical structure, you can use all your 2D skills to effectively 3D model. So it's like maybe 2.5D or something. Um, here's another stencil map, another example. And then I throw them on a really simple shape, like this spaceship. It's really just like a big stretched ellipsoid shape, and there's a little bit of modeling pulling out those little wing shapes. But all the graphics, the translucency, all of that's coming from my stencil maps. So, and you'll see towards the end of this presentation that there's a lot I do now um, using materials inside Modo to drive early concepts. Same with this simple shape, um, but the stencil is creating those holes. It's not modeled, those openings to the skin underneath. Same here, those hexagon shapes up there. Those are actually cut out, not in the model, but cut out with a stencil map. And then I've also turned on a displacement uh, layer to actually give me fake thickness to that skin. So if you look at this perforation here, look at the holes on this ship, you'll see that it looks like they have thickness to the skin and the cut lines. Um, well, that's not in the model. This actually comes just from my maps. So I'm using a displacement map um, layer with a... Um, stencil layer. Oh, and transparency amount, right? Because we see through it a little bit. So it's full of mechanism. It's just, and that's using replicators, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there's another example. And so 3D replicators in Moto. I really love 3D replicators. I use them now whenever I get a chance because they're so much fun. Um, basically, the concept is you take a simple mesh. Well, it doesn't even have to be a simple mesh, but you take a mesh and then you take a 3D object, um, like a little panel, like here on the left, this little organic shape, and you um, set it up. And I have different zones, like in the case of doing these suits, which I already have a little you know, lecture about those on my YouTube channel, so I'm not going to talk a lot about these. But um, you just set it up to replicate and across that surface. And so what you get, like in this case, are suits of armor. There's a couple different shaders I'm playing with here. Uh, Rob Baldwin showed me how to play with this sort of, you know, cell-shaded look by turning on these contoured edges. 
Um, and then the one on the far right is a detail of a suit I'm going to show you some step-by-steps of in a minute. So these are the kind of suits that I get um, just using those replicators straight up out of Modo. And this is essentially like my first digital sketch. And um, there's a base figure, obviously, but you could go to, you know, Turbo Squid, anywhere to get a base figure. There's base figures in ZBrush. That's not hard to come by. Um, throw it into Modo, set up a little plate or a couple of different plates, um, you know, drop on some interesting materials you want to explore, and then just replicate it across the surface. And I'm replicating at different, um, you know, densities in different parts, like the hands versus the arm versus the chest. And then I've got a couple layers offsetting. And then, so the far left would be like, if you say he was out in the snow or something, maybe I use that for a weathering pass and white dust. And I'm going to put it over one of these orange suits later. And the middle one is the base render. And then the one on the far right, I've gone in and started touching it up in Photoshop. So you'll see on his chest, I've started to refine some of those, um, you know, part where the parts are running into themselves. So I started to fix that up a bit, added a little bit of Fresnel effect to the visor, added a bit of a hot, you know, specular highlight on the visor as well. So I just keep, you would just keep going like that to finish the figure. And I'm going to show you a couple of those in a minute. Here's a couple more that I've done. And you can see, and this is a very interesting process because you start m much more complex um, and then you work backwards. So what I mean by that is that usually you start with traditional sense, you start with a sketch and every step of the way it gets more and more complex all the way up to like a full photo reel Photoshop rendering. In this case, you start photo reel and super complex and then you have to edit and refine and go backwards. And you can do it for organic things, you know, that's just like a little potato chip shape, put across that head. Um, here's like a sci-fi cityscape, start to that, dual suns. Um, so you can get a lot of fun atmospherics. These are some of my vehicles from uh, Drive, I think, and I just took like two of them and spun them, you know, 90 degrees upward and turned on a couple little glowing polygons to make it look like lights. And then I just replicated them across a ground plane and turned on some atmosphere and then put one of them up here in the far right. And I probably just blurred that in Photoshop is my guess. And um, that was it. So it's a, it's a start for a sci-fi cityscape. Here's another start. These are actually parts from one of the wheels that I made for uh, one of the salvage vehicles out of drive. So I took those pieces, recombined them onto these sort of box shapes and added a couple little glass panels. And those could easily become uh, skyscrapers. Same here, same environment, just change the camera position down to the ground plane. And then here's another one, you know, a base, a base block in to start painting over. So here I pulled out a couple step-by-steps out of my Photoshop file. So you can see that idea of starting much more complex than you need and then refining it in the opposite direction, which is basically editing and simplifying. So you'll see it's set to like two seconds per frame here or something. And um, I'm going in and I'm making design decisions. What do I want to keep? What do I want to get rid of? Um, I'm also going to add some weathering to this. And then you just go in and start painting in Photoshop. And of course, every time you look at the design, you could come up with, you know, 10 more iterations of this all based on that same base render. So um, they're kind of fun to go back and revisit. You could also use those base renders to layer over other um, images. So it's kind of endless in the amount of variation you can get. And that's that's a quick example of something that I do say in like an afternoon. Uh, here's another one. Um, this is the one I showed the detail of earlier. So you see how it starts coming straight out of Moto. That was the base, base render and how much you can embellish it. And I'm going to weather it up. I'm actually going to move his pose a bit. Uh, when I'm doing straight design work, I don't worry about moving the pose because I'm worried about the suit design and not about the character as much. I like I want the character of the design, but I don't really care about the asymmetry of the pose. But you can see it's not that tough. Um, it's just a little cut and paste, repose, um, you know, clinch a fist, that sort of thing. And here I'm going to do a little asymmetric lighting. So turn on a little blue light from out of frame on the right. And then I'm going to warm up the center here with a bit of a spotlight. And then turn on a little, you know, render and a couple of specular highlights. Um, colorized and texture the background, adds a couple little graphics and details, and that's about it. 
I think it's almost done. Yep, a little levels adjustment at the end and finished. And here's a collage. So collage I like to use a lot. Um, really, I use collage a lot to find um, interesting shapes. And this, this falls probably more into the um, inspirational category. So I make these uh, very high res black and white images of um, interesting shapes. And what I like to do is set up like multiple horizon lines. I like to add a lot of atmosphere. And then what I do is zoom into them and start moving around the canvas uh, and the image and then pull out interesting compositions that I like. So you can see it's all sorts of, see they're kind of in bands of horizontal lines and a couple of vertical, you know, columns. And that allows me to move in and out and find multiple horizon lines. And um, you could do it just in one image, of course, but in this way I find it's a little bit more free to just let happy accidents, you know, occur. And then you zoom into that and all you're looking for is a little spark of inspiration. And, and because there's a lot of uh, atmosphere and value changing from foreground to background, we see environments, we see a lot of, you know, depth because of atmospheric perspective. And so then I'll use these as the basis for a painting, and then I'll start painting back over them inside Photoshop. So these are the ones I pulled directly out of some of those kind of compositions without any painting happening yet. These are just the straight custom brushes, um, just literally happy accident style. Um, and then you would take those and then you start to paint into them. This is not finished, but it's just a start. You can see them. then you start to get rid of the little bit of the... Um, you know, the transparency and overlapping, like this build is darker building here in the midground, just to the right of center, and the one in the background. Just glazed over those a bit, started refining the architecture. Here's some organic shapes, you know, pools of water, and that's what I saw in that one, and, and a lot of that's, you know, had very little painting over the top yet. This one's had a little bit more painting, you know, probably an hour or so, and I've, I saw this cool sort of, you know, bottom of a big blimp or, you know, balloon shape, and the balloon's way out of frame, and he's, you know, cruising along, flying into this uh, background image there. And here's another one. This is just the straight custom brush, you know, happy accident style, no painting back into it yet. And here's, this one's had a bit more weathering, etc., but still in the realm of speed painting. This one I wanted to show, it's not about actually the this little flying blimp here, it's actually about the architecture, and if you look at this, uh, feature sticking off of that that faceted building. Um, that element there was created with like two brush strokes uh, using my mouse. So just click once, then click twice, and because my brush was set to randomize, um, it gave me that, that angle there and it twisted. And then same with the architecture in the very background. It's really easy to do abstract architecture that way, um, just using custom brushes. These are some custom brushes that I sort of uh, just, you know, touched around the canvas and then warped them a bit. And then I actually have brushes for these guys. This is when I was working on Alien Race, the book. And um, actually we made brushes for the whole team, which were, you know, in this case you can see it's like a greyhound dog. We paint a little figure on it and another one in the back. And those are just placeholders that we could use to just drop into our scenes to uh, help establish the scale and the track and the action that we wanted to do. And then later we would come back and redesign the, the uh, creature and you know that sort of thing so this is kind of a, a collaged abstract background and then i took some of my pencil sketches um, of various creatures running and racing and dropped them in to start to establish a scene and you can do the same for vehicles so that you see the wheels are very tight they're like a 3d model so i think I, that's probably out of moto and then i would click and warp these um, brushes across that surface so it's again using abstraction to find interesting directions Traditional media, I like to do collage with traditional media as well. Um, I collage it digitally, but all the drawings are traditional media. So this is marker sketch um, on vellum, and then I've composited several of them over the top of each other, and then I'll go and paint back over the top. This would be like from my creating, uh, I think, well, I can't remember the name of that DVD I did. Uh, it's like creating unique environments, I think. Um, and this is one of the techniques I like to do, just so... It's different than traditional drawing. You just you start with something, right? And then you see atmosphere, you see shapes. And, and in this case, I saw like three figures standing on this balcony. And so that's where the, the I started painting. Um, didn't finish it, but this is just like a quick start. And the spark of inspiration came from the collage. And then you use your traditional skills to start to convey the materials, the perspective, you know, the design elements you want to add, little 
you know, mountain environment. I don't know what this is. It's nothing yet, but that's what a raw, you know, collaged traditional media sketch looks like. And then I'm going to show you a couple more. Here's another. And then you can go back and paint into it. So here I've added some figures. So here's one that's, um, this is the raw collage uh, marker sketch. And I use a lot of uh, like markers on vellum in this case to get a lot of extra texture. And then there's a couple ships that I added. And those are just uh, regular pen sketches. Dropped them back in, started refining the lighting a bit. And then this painting became this rendering. I think this was for Concept Design 2, I believe. Anyway, you can see where it came from. Look at the, the main rock structures are still there. And I've replaced the sky and I replaced the background using some of my other custom brushes. And then I changed the foreground ships and we're flying down through this triangular gate. I see if some sort of training exercise or something. Because if obviously you miss the gate, you're in trouble because you hit a big rock. So here's another marker collage. And then that's what I saw in that collage. And that's the rough painting about, you know, just the rough start. And then you'll see, look at the building on the far left. You'll see a lot of these stay the same. I'll go back one. So, and then even the mid building, right? The mid ground building back there, the silhouette came from the marker sketch. And you see it's remained very untouched. I like the proportions, I like the shapes. And I just had to refine it and work out the perspective, the atmospheric perspective, the lighting, the materials, etc. Here's another one. This one's been painted over a bit already, but it's one of those black and white collages. And then that's what it turned into. But there it was. So I found that it was the inspiration for that scene was these people going up this kind of stairs or escalator. A couple of guys in the foreground I saw working on computers and I saw this ship being moved on some big overhead crane assembly. And then that's where it turned, that's what it turned into after a couple of days in Photoshop. So digital sketching. Um, like digital sketching, of course, and um, I like to work in alchemy a lot, especially when I'm looking for happy accidents. Happy accidents are, um, you know, like I've said, the abstraction is really fun. So alchemy is a great program for that. It's a free program you can download. Here's the website, right, al.chemy.org, alchemy.org. And um, it's uh, super fun. There's no command Z. So it's incredibly fast. I like to make rough out scenes. Um, it's, you can actually mirror things so I can set up some reflections. So I can say like, well, this is some big snow scene or maybe that's a lake or maybe it's ice. Um, and then I just sort of work around and play with the tools and see what you can come up with. So here's one that I took a little more time and tried to actually draw something. So it's some sort of weird floating vehicle and it's skimming. You know, it's got these little hydrofoil things, and I don't know, it's floating along and going over ice or water, just touching the surface, and it's going towards some structure in the distance. And here's here it is applied to vehicles. These were, again, for these were out of uh, drive. And you can see the raw alchemy sketches along the bottom, those three. And there's a quick paint over in Photoshop. The mirroring tool is cool, because if you look at the front views, it's really fun to get that live mirroring happening. And I mean, the two best programs for that I think, um, are Sketchbook Pro and Alchemy. But Alchemy has no Command-Z and not very many tools. But um, Sketchbook Pro does that, and it's great for doing characters, um, vehicles, anything that's you know perfectly symmetrical. This was one that was done in also Alchemy to come up with that base environment. So this is another thing I like to do called uh, Brush Warp Render. That's what I call it. And it's using my custom brushes. But it's trying to be more true to an existing package, in this case, like a vehicle package that I would make in 3D with the wheelbase and, you know, the proper proportions for whatever you needed it to be. And then what I like to do is click an interesting custom brush, click it once over the form, and then warp it across the hard points. And what I mean by the hard points are things like wheels and uh, doors and things, you know, you can't move, like the position of where the people are and their headroom and that sort of stuff. So in a way, it's like you can't cheat because you have a 3D base model with all the hard points locked in. and on, But on the flip side, you're kind of working more abstract than things that you might normally draw. So these are the very, very first examples and tests of doing that, where I would just click a brush and then warp it across and around the hard points. Like you see the front there kind of starts to look interesting, right? Where you warp that around. And um, that's a nice, it's an interesting way to start. And it's maybe some shapes that I wouldn't have sketched. And I think this is great for 
uh, designers to use that are sort of, you know, well-established and practiced and they're kind of in a bit of, I don't want to say a rut, but they have some muscle memory, right? So you develop muscle memory when you draw the same shapes over and over again. And we all draw our favorite shapes, right? So we all develop muscle memory. But at a certain point, right, you always get briefs and you get projects and they require different aesthetic directions. And it's hard sometimes to break out of your muscle memory. So this is one of those exercises what I try to do to break out of that, which is to, um, you know, click and warp, and it gives me things I wouldn't normally draw. So these are some custom brushes I made for automotive purposes or vehicles. And, you know, vehicles have a lot of transitional forms, which basically are gradations, and they have a lot of controlled edges. So I took some photos of edges and gradations, basically. These are a little twisted up. Uh, they're first cut pieces of paper that I cut accelerating lines into, and then I twisted them, and then I threw them down on a, you know, white piece of foam core or something. I took some pictures, and I used those, uh, turned those into custom brushes inside Photoshop. And then I would click and warp those across the shape. Here's an example of using like a flame silhouette kind of brush, and then I've just clicked and I've warped it across some hard points. And so you can see you get a cohesive aesthetic if your brushes all match each other. I like to use Photo Booth a lot. Um, Photo Booth is a really simple program. Comes on every, you know, Mac and every iPad and every, not even maybe an iPhone even. I'm not sure, but definitely on an iPad and a, a Mac. And if you have a camera, what you can do is it just a, it's just a mirroring program, and uh, you hold up something in front of the camera and it mirrors it. So these are crumpled up pieces of paper, and I might use these for spaceships. And in this case, I've introduced a ground plane, so it looks like it's floating above, right? And I have top light. So I get, you know, a shadow that's roughly correct. It's, you can see the light's coming a little bit from the outside, so the shadow's a bit narrower than the object. Uh, better to get your lighting dead center. Also, when you paint them, it's better to have your lighting dead center because you only have to paint half and then mirror it to the other side in Photoshop. So I'm getting all these quirky little spaceships. These are the 18th scale car models, right? And these are the rear wings. So you see I flipped it 90 degrees, and that could be like a cool little spaceship you know, so these are, again, to, to inspire me to find, that's also a car, but it could be a cool little submersible. And and that's my shoe, one of my shoes, um, a real shoe. Um, but that could be like a cool little, you know, tech hand grenade or something for a video game. This is, you know, it could be a robot head. That could be also a little vehicle that's landed. Maybe those are, that's the landing gear sticking out, the cockpit's dead center, but it's actually the hood of an 18th scale car. This could be some nice armor. I could see that, right? But it's a piece of tin foil that's been crumbled up. That could be also a cool top view of some little speeder or something. And so you can see here, this is a quick demo of how you could actually use those things. I didn't spend any time cleaning it up, but integrated a shot I took for, at the Indianapolis 500 of the guys walking through uh, back to the pit lane and under the grandstands and then layered in a couple of little textures, took this, started to light it you know, cohesively with cast shadows, that sort of thing. And that's how you could use some of these little simple shapes as inspiration, right, for something, for either a book illustration, entertainment work. Here I took that previous submersible, I made it to another one, and you can see you could just spend more time painting it up. Here was a robot head, but it was actually part of an engine. So just collaging those sampled pieces together. Here's one I put in some characters from Alien Race, so it's a little flying vehicle. I like to do this a lot with organic things as well. So the process came from uh, Alien Race. That's where we sort of hit upon this idea. And so you see John Park and Ben Morrow there holding up some props that we got at the store one day to create a bunch of uh, crazy, not only characters, but helmets, like you see in the upper right there. So this is all in the book Alien Race. And you'll see that all of these things are great starts for um, characters. And then what we do is we just take those and we paint back over them in Photoshop. So the one on the left is a seashell. The one on the right was actually my wife's uh, hand and foot. And I saw that character in there. And then we had costumes as well that we've also shot in photo booth. The one on the left here is a red potato uh, with some, you know, it's a nasty red potato, old with some eyes growing out of it. That became this character. This one was a, uh, a bird's nest in a wood bowl. That's what I'm holding on the right. And I saw that character in there, the seashell on the right. And so, What's fun about that is that if you look at the range of styles, um, you know, I'm not a character person, but if by having interesting starts and using my fundamental, you know, drawing and painting and material indication skills, I can actually get a huge range of characters, um, you know, and get away from the things that I might normally draw 
uh, that I'd be predisposed to drawing if I had to start drawing from scratch every single time. So I find this, this again, inspiration in the abstraction is really fun. And if you have great foundation skills, you can apply that. You can use the abstraction to a, a higher level, I think. This is a crumpled up piece of paper. I did this in uh, Luca, Italy, when I was in the trade show booth there. And you'll see I'm going to have two characters coming here out of the same piece of paper. So first one is this guy. So that's the character head. And if I go back, you'll actually start to see there's the mouth. You see where I found the eyes, the nose, etc. The next one is actually this flying guy. And my character is now riding him. And if we go back, you'll see that the tail or the bottom of this, what was his chin and mouth, when we look at the bird, turns into these, you know, exhaust ports with a stinger. And then the nose turned into his head. And then I just stretched where the eyes were. I just pulled them inside Photoshop and those became the wings. And so, and then I just stuck my guy on top of there. This was a seashell, some sort. This guy was uh, a gourd, actually, like, you know, like a pumpkin sort of thing. Photography's great. I do a lot of photography when I'm traveling. And um, this is an example. Uh, so I'm going to show you lots of examples of photography now. So bridge thumbnails. So I use the program Bridge, and uh, it comes with Photoshop. And when I call it, so bridge thumbnails, um, I actually like to zoom way out of my images and look at them with a different perspective, really, just a different point of view, and think about them not being the subject that they were. So, you know, this is a this is just walking along the beach in Mendocino, shooting a bunch of macro shots. Looks like a lot of macro photography. And then when you zoom back, even though it was the microscopic world, you can see them as other things. You can see them as abstract landscapes. You can see them as planets. You can see them as architecture. Here's a bunch of aliens, right? These are all the aliens that, uh, that I shot in photo booth. I have, between Neville and myself, I think we have probably 10,000 of these things. And anytime we need to start something uh, and we're stuck, um, there's no source of inspiration, you just pull up one of these pages, right? And there's many, many, many pages of these things. And they can be for anything. It can be a spark inspiration for a piece of armor or a piece of uh, a costume of some sort or a spaceship or a character head in this case. So you can see lots of different starts there. And here's some architecture, um, and maybe in the upper left, but it doesn't really matter what it is, what it started as. These are um, thumbnails of like my zoom blur photography, which I'll talk about in a minute, and some more macro stuff at the bottom. These are um, actually squeeze scapes, is what I call them. It's using photo booth again, using there's a squeeze filter on it that squeezes whatever you're photographing to a single point. And when you squeeze things to a single point, it makes it look like it's one point perspective. So when I zoom back at these and I, you know, I, you know, zoom out and I look at them as thumbnails, I see really interesting environments, even though all of these are my 18 scale car models photographed using that pinch filter inside photo booth. So it just creates that one point perspective. Um, and you, and you see they lack atmosphere, of course, because the scale uh, isn't, you know, large, so you don't get atmospheric perspective. But that's one of the easiest things to add inside Photoshop. So you can see those are nice starts. You can zoom into those, open them up, and then before you forget what you saw in the thumbnail, you quickly crop it and then start painting into it. Macro photography I just talked about a little bit. Uh, I like to do a lot of this. Again, usually when I'm traveling or on vacation. You know, and I can see a character head in, uh, in that one. Right. Maybe I use this for some skin texture. It looks like a repulsive belly button right there. Um, this is even more repulsive, but it's just seaweed. Some scratches. You know, it's nice to see the, the, the grain and texture. Maybe I use that on some sort of sci-fi suit. I could layer it on later. This could be part of a planet. This could be dwellings on a cliffside. Those could actually be organic spaceships. Right. This could be a... I, this looks like a nice planet. Right. If you look on the right hand side, you see that sort of spherical shape. Then you could just clean up the left hand side and make that into a nice uh, moon with crater impacts. But it's actually a kelp ball right down at the beach. There's nice textures. That's a crab shell. Nice iridescence across that. It's another shell. And then when I also do photography, I like to do subject specific things. So in this case, here's a photograph of a dirt bike and then you're just going to paint over the top. So this is the really obvious way to use photography. Uh, for concept design and concept art and industrial design is to go out 
and go for a specific photo shoot and shoot the things you need to incorporate into what you're currently designing. So I shot these uh, jets um, at a couple of either museums or at the uh, on top of the Midway. There's a bunch of jets down in San Diego. And I wanted this um, aesthetic to layer back into this motor motorcycle I showed earlier. So here's the thing I shot. And then you can see I've incorporated some of those aesthetics, right, the graphics into the bike. You know, the idea was that there was some, you know, uh, ex-Navy uh, mechanics and they took this naval aircraft stuff and they took the spare parts and they made their own sci-fi vehicles. So here's a photograph I took on the uh, USS Midway down in San Diego. And then here's, you can see it layered in, bits and pieces of that photograph layered into that top view um, on the left. Uh, so Anise, actually all three of us worked on this one. Uh, Danny Gardner, myself, and Anise Naeem, we worked on this guy. I blocked out the scene, laid in the guys, then I think Danny took a shot at it, detailing out, and then Anise finally did the last pass, I think, and uh, took all of us to get enough detail in there without losing interest. But um, I like that piece. Ultimately, it became the cover of the book. Um, this is like a candelabra or something, I think, from Africa. Uh, but I saw it as kind of a cool building shape. And this ground plane being reflective saw it as water. I haven't painted over it yet, and I have a ton of those kind of things. And also I shoot things for textures and materials. Um, maybe this would be a cool gate. It's actually a face shield for a gladiator helmet. Rocks, of course. You know, other bits and pieces. So those are kind of subject specific. If you had, you know, an idea of what you were designing, you go out and do a shoot specifically to get colors, textures, materials um, to either layer directly back into your pieces or to use them as an inspirational start. So there's natural things. This is a uh, these are rocks in the mineral uh, collection at the Royal Ontario Museum of either natural history or art. I'm not sure. It's called the ROM in Toronto. So I went and shot like 300 of these things in one day. And here's what I would do with them. So I saw, I, I, when I shot that, I immediately saw this cool little faceted rock, you know, uh, robot mech critter. And uh, and I saw a rider up on top in that big block and then just went back to, to the hotel room where I was staying and did a little paint over in the afternoon. So here's one. I, I was wanting to do a bunch of uh, mechs for our book, Nothing But Mech. We have another one coming up. I'll probably do some more similar ones for that. And um, so I said, well, what has, what automatically has those kinds of, you know, pivots and joints and things? What could I go out and research? And I thought, oh, fossils, that's that's great. You know, dinosaur skeletons and that sort of thing. They've got all of those um, elements already there. It's just pivots and, you know, linkages and that sort of thing. So that'd be really easy to turn that into a mechanized uh you know, creature or in this case, vehicle. This guy's riding it, driving it. And I layered back in some of that um, mechanical tech from the other photographs, like through the belly area. And then here you see the final. And then that's back to the beginning. So there's the final. That's where it came from. And you see how it all works. So here's a, some sericite um, that I like the I like the structure of this, and it really inspired me to to think about, oh, I, I want to stretch that and change it, but I love the, the base, the core structure of the way that that uh, sericite formed. And I want to refine it and play with it and explore, could I also make it into this little walking uh, vehicle? So I put a guy on top, changed, played with the scale, distorted it, just in Photoshop, playing around with it. And there you go. I think it's a couple of little more tweaks. So I, there's some step-by-steps. So obviously the last one was step-by-step. -step. I wasn't pointing out the exact things I was doing, it's pretty obvious. Um, each one of those was kind of a layer. I just went back into my Photoshop file and opened those up to save out some stills. So just a simple step-by-step. -step. This is something I call wallscapes. Wallscapes are um, this thing I kind of happened upon while traveling and was putting my camera on the wall and shooting along the wall. And um, what was interesting is that when you shoot on a wall, the wall becomes the ground plane and then everything sticking off of that wall becomes a piece of architecture or a structure growing 90 degrees out of the ground plane. And windows become water, which is pretty cool. So because they're reflective. So all you have to do is, you know, add ripples and that sort of stuff. So this is an Eric Owen Moss building uh, just down the street from my studio here in Culver City. You see the cars in the parking lot in the upper right. And so these are some things that I would shoot. And I just immediately saw that window as water 
um, and it's it's actually a window against some stucco, so it actually looks like you know some ground the bottom of that pool in there. These are some more. Just walking around the neighborhood. This is having dinner, just shooting, you know, putting against this is a big window, which I saw as a pool of water. And so I'll use these as underpaintings to paint back over this uh, uh, alley in Italy. There's some signage on the side of a building up in Toronto. Here's another one. So here's an example of how I'd paint this over. The painting's not done yet, but this is where it came from. This is my inspiration. I saw this huge, you know, ground plane here, in the, here and I like this big arching building. But of course, it's not a building. It's just a sign and um, some lights hanging off but those became cool interesting things i think i ditched those in the end so here i still kept the big arching building kept the ground plane and then i started taking some traditional sketches um, like this guy in the foreground the other people the ships those are all traditional marker sketches I just started dropping them in and populating the scene and then you've seen the upper right that control tower is just a few of my custom brushes that i stamped and so at this point you sort of start to see everything come together and so this is maybe like a pipeline but it's actually a vertical gutter, right? And that's a little overhang at the roof, but the nice, you know, ground plane. And you just need to add atmosphere and you can end up with a cool shape. This is the Tate Modern in London. That's the ceiling, but I saw it as a cool wall, fisheye lens, punched a hole in the wall in the back. And it's obviously it's photo manipulation, but if you do it cleverly and you shot the images, right? You own the images that you shoot. I just see, you know, photography as another tool and another art form that you can put with, um, you know, your drawing and painting skills. And I don't really see them as being different. It's just image creation. And whether you draw it or you paint it doesn't really matter um, just because the tools are so different now and we have more options. So there's that alleyway and I saw the, the electrical lines on the sides of buildings as a pipeline. And this isn't finished by any means, just a rough out, you know, exploratory sketch. Same here. And then changing the scale of the same image getting a different result. So I took those wallscapes and I use the cutout filter a lot in Photoshop to abstract things um, in order to get them away from what they originally were and help me see something different in the image. So these are some of those wallscapes that I've actually just applied the cutout filter in Photoshop. And it helps me see different forms and takes me away from the fact that this is probably like a telephone pole on the left right? It's probably a shot straight up looking at a telephone pole and some other, who knows, other posts or something in the distance up against a building. And when you flip it 90 degrees out of, you know, orientation, you see a whole different composition. So it's about tricking your brain to see different compositions, see different, you know, potential starts. This is one of those earlier uh, parking lot ones. You can see, actually see the cars in the upper left. And, you know, I might crop into a small area of that and then start painting over the top. There's a nice sort of you know, triangular structure out there way in the distance. And I just need to add more atmosphere, add some figures, you know, and I'm almost done. Here's an example. I just took this one. I just used the cutout filter and I added a figure to it. And I saw it as like this, you know, opening out to a lighter environment. And there's just this beam of light had come through and lit the ground plane where the person was walking. Don't ask me why it's lit then from the back. So um, anyway, artistic license. Zoom blur. So... This is getting to be a pretty long talk. I thought maybe I'd do it quick, but I'm up to like 47 minutes. Um, anyway, this is uh, another one of my source books. So I do a lot of zoom blur photography. So you take a telephoto lens, and when you are taking your photo, you twist the lens. And in this case, it's a, with a Nikon D200. And the lens, I think, is like 18 to 200 millimeter. And when you twist it, um, Right when you're zooming, when you're taking a picture, it turns into one-point perspective. So that's where all the streaks come from, going in and out of the image. Right, so we, immediately I start to see environments, of course, once it's in one-point perspective, and then the curving is because I'm moving, I'm sweeping or moving my arms in an odd, you know, fashion, and um, in creating these curves. So this is a zoom blur. But I see like cool, you know, spaceships in the sky or a huge ship or something that's moving. And then there's a distant horizon there on the, off, on the left with a bright spot from the sun overhead or something. And then in the foreground, maybe this is a huge sand dune. So it's like a slightly tilted horizon off in the distance there. And those can stimulate, you know, your brain to see different things. And they're great to paint over. Great fun. And also times I just use them for the color palettes. I use them for textures, throw them into a, a Photoshop file. You know, just to add a little color and texture. 
So that's what these are. These are, you know, lights at night and you just move around. You, you look, you look a little odd when you take these pictures, but you just have to get in there gorilla style, do it, and then quickly make your escape. So that's what these, that's where, how these were generated. You know, I can easily use them for backgrounds. So here's one I painted over just a really quick uh, speed painting. And uh, so there it was, and I saw it's like furrows on the ground, like this field been plowed or something. And then there's some distant uh, structure there. And just like the suits that suits start super complex, these are also super complex, like the replicator suits. And you can see all sorts of things in this image. So I could revisit this image, you know, once every day for several weeks and create a totally different painting every time. So this is the one that I just used a couple custom brushes. There's a, little, there's a treaded vehicle here in the foreground that's heading off there towards those what looks like you know kind of like oil pumps or something here's another one this was actually like the side of a wine bottle on a table or something and then uh, just a couple custom brushes along that uh you know archway along in the distance there and i saw these huge fields of green so immediately i thought grass of course and then threw in a couple of custom brush brushes there i mirrored them to turn so using like the photo booth skills now for my practical painting to create a couple ships, add a little exhaust, and done. Super fast. Traditional media sketching, of course, I still do a lot of that. Um, and I like to work in various mediums, depending what I'm looking for. So these are some marker sketches with a bit of gouache and pen. Um, graphite sketches, brush pen sketching with marker. I usually do the light marker first. These are sketches I did for Blast. These are a marker first with a little bit of high-tech pen and a little bit of gouache and a little color marker there for the windows. These are, again, a little light marker first with a brush pen, the Pentel pocket brush. I like that pen quite a bit. These are marker with uh, ballpoint. And these are marker with gouache. Uh, no pen, no pencil. Um, just straight marker first, then gouache to finish with the, the darks and the lights and the little tiny lines. Cutout filter. So revisit the cutout filter here, and because I think it has a great application to sketches, and so I like to take my brush pen sketches and apply the cutout filter. And you can see, just watch the ship in the middle here. Um, watch it transform from what would be basically an expected kind of all these things look familiar to me, like things I would draw because of my muscle memory right? I, I just want to draw certain shapes. I like certain shapes, but I need to break out of that. And if I want to break out and inspire something new, using the cutout filter can help push me in that direction. So you see how that center ship transforms from something expected to something unexpected with a different aesthetic, but still has the same overall proportions that I liked. So this is the cutout filter applied to a bunch of my brush pen sketches. Here's some creatures from Alien Race right here, um, same sort of thing, just to sort of push me in a different direction, change the shape of the writer, um, get some more interesting graphics across the shape, and, and sort of stylize my sketch. Okay, this is the last section, the last folder. Um, texture replication in Modo, also called, uh, known as texture bombing. So this is something I've been doing a lot of the last year or so, and I'm gonna finish with a couple of more recent examples of this. And where you take custom brush, um, image maps that you create, and then you just project them across your skins or your 3D meshes to get interesting directions. So all of these are playing only with the materials and not with the modeling of the figure. These figures are provided. Neville Page gave me these again, because I don't want to have to go and create the figure. I want to get right into doing the suit. And so you just, you can go buy a mesh, you can make your own, ask a buddy uh, in this case. And so I'm just playing with materials and the materials are driving the aesthetic of the suit. And all those materials um, are texture maps that I created in Photoshop. And so these are all examples of that. In this case, there's multiple skins. There's a more detailed talk about this um, on my YouTube channel, so I'm going to sort of zoom through these. But I like to do this quite a bit. And I think it gives me interesting aesthetics. And, it, and again, things that I might not normally draw. And definitely some things I can't draw like this. You're not going to invest that amount of time to see that interesting shape. You know, and who wants to draw that fishnet, gold fishnet, look on that guy's uh, intermediate skin there on that suit. So if you want to learn more about that one, I'd say watch that lecture. Um, so let me zoom through these suits a bit, see if I can keep this thing under an hour. It's uh, six, six minutes to go to wrap it up. 
So this one's uh, texture bombing. I took that picture and I put it on that skin and I got those three variations just by changing the algorithm and using the sliders to give me variation. So it's really awesome. It's a Calder Mobile I shot it in uh, DC and just put it on the suit to see what it would give me as a start. And none of these, none of these, of these have gone further than this. Um, they're just where this thing ended. Um, I haven't refined any of them really. I did this thing for Honda. I was doing a little inspirational talk down there. So I just took a little speed form shape and made quickly in moto. I took this photo, which was one of their concept cars and I layered it back over the top and texture bombed it. And um, there's no cut lines on the model. There's nothing, there's no door. There's just, that's where it happened to land. Um, and I just, I like that one. So again, happy accidents kind of controlled chaos. There's no deep vent there. That's just all in the photograph and it's starting to hint at that. And then you would take this thing and paint back over and change it. This is one of my paintings from Blast um, put onto the speed form shape, right? And none of those cut lines are across the hood there. That detail isn't there, that air intake, none of that exists in the model. It's all being driven by the materials. So these are examples of those, right? All those vents, all that stuff is in my Photoshop. And these are actually those uh, fuzzy custom brush, uh, twisted pieces of paper. That's what's giving me the, this design. And so you can see it's just to, again, stimulate your brain, help inspire you to see new things. And um, so using these new tools, right, the 3D tools, not that they're necessarily new anymore, but using them in kind of in a new way, slightly, um, just using them more as a design tool, um, less as a straight production tool, um, you can come up with some really interesting directions. So you can see, you know, that super fast, I get all those different directions. And this is going to be my last set, and I'm going to lead into the, my very latest project, which I've been featuring a lot on my Facebook page lately. Um, so you can take uh, hand-drawn sketches and put them on. This is another texture map. And uh, so I think it's super fun. So anyway, the last thing I've been doing is now I've been applying this to a much more real silhouette and project in the form of uh, footwear. And when I look at footwear, I see it mostly as a, you know, graphic design exercise when, you know, the, sh the sole or the platform of shoe stays the same, you know, for a couple of years and on just the upper changes um, four times a year. That's to me really a styling project. And when I look at shoes and I look at just the upper, it looks to me like mostly a graphic design project, um, at least at the initial start. And so that's what I like. That's what I've been doing lately with this same process. There's a few more little tricks and things we've done to finesse the process. Um, Rob Baldwin and I have been working on this uh, for the last month or so. And um, over that last couple of weeks, I've generated about 900 of these. So I think there's value in, you know, how fast they can be done and how quickly they stimulate your brain to see designs that you would then draw and paint back over the top. So this is effectively now my first uh, digital sketch. So that's where I'm going to leave it with you. Um, hope you enjoyed it, seeing some of the ways that I, you know, trick my brain into seeing other things. And please go visit my blog and my Facebook page and keep up to date on all that good stuff. And I'll post another one of these next Friday. Have a great week.